Hey guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you most likely have heard, or if you haven't heard, what we're about at the Beacon Fight for Life is reconnecting the Australian multicultural community. Our main goal is to reduce the number of Australians taking their own life in Australia. Currently, suicide is the leading cause of death of all Australians 15 to 44 for men. Uh, Indigenous people are three times likely to take their own life, and, and it's sad to say that 65,000 people a year in Australia attempt suicide. So the Beacon Fight for Life, we want to reduce the number of people taking their own life, and so what we're going to, we're going to play over the coming months is some footage of conversations I've had with individuals, groups, multicultural, you name it, I'll interview them, so that we can start to make inroads for people um, to stop them from taking their own life give them information and places to reach out to. So, stay tuned. Hi guys, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life. As you know, the Beacon Fight for Life, what we're about is um, reducing the number of Australians taking their own life. We do that through suicide prevention techniques. Um, today I'm, I'm joined with David Elsie, who's a, uh, his company name is Positive Change Therapy. David is a life change mentor and analytical psych psychotherapist, master practice practitioner of NLP, a hypnotherapist and quantum counsellor. David facilitates processes to change negative thinking and behaviour patterns and develops methods to achieve personal and professional goals. David divides his time with his private practice and programs online to face uh, and face to face, plus facilitating wellness and life skill workshops. His clientele profiles range from debilitating mental issues to those in need of change or improvement in any area of their life. David works with clients from all over the world. His mission is to heal and educate people with a variety of best practice methods, breaking down old belief systems to live a life of peace and purpose, guiding others to authentically share and express their unique sovereignty. After a lifetime of experience and his own story of transformation, David initially created a private practice in South Fremantle in 2010, then later in Melbourne. From 2014, he lived in Bali, Indonesia, where he had his private practice and was a head counsellor at Savannah Treatment Centre for six years before he recently returned to his hometown Perth, Western Australia. David, welcome. Hi Derek, thanks for being here. Fantastic. No, thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, you're a life change mentor. Why would I be looking for a life change mentor? And who, do, who, would, be, who would be a typical client? Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on, on Beacon Fight for Life. I think it's a wonderful organization. Thank you. And I'm Thank happy you. to be a part of it. And uh, I'm just glad to be able to be of service yep. and uh, provide something. If I, something today, it becomes, um, good knowledge and helpful to someone, yep. then uh, I'll be really happy about Thank that. Thank you, I appreciate so, yeah. it. But if you're gonna come to, if you if you wanna come and see me, it'll be really anything that that's not working for you from anxiety to depression to, um, I mean, I've had a cross section of a whole lot of different types of issues, mental issues. I've mm. also had people who are just generally stuck in life and they just want a bit of a help to resource them again. Yeah, get, get them back to, to who they are, get them back to the truth of who they are. Okay. Yeah. Uh, NLP, what does that stand for? Neuro Linguistic Psychology or Programming. Okay. Mm. Can you give me an example of what that is? So it, it's NLP's, it was created in the 70s. Yeah. Um, and it's a trail of techniques or processes designed along with hypnotherapy techniques to access change um, at an unconscious level. Okay. So we're trying, the NLP is designed to kind of trip up the conscious living side of things mm -hmm. and go to the right side of the brain where, where change occurs. Okay. You specialise in hypnotherapy. How many years have you been mm -hmm. doing that? Since 2010. So that's what, 11, nearly 11th year. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Have you got some stories, yeah. a story to share about that? Oh, um, hypnotherapy, well, yeah. yeah, the training was fabulous. I mean, you've seen those hypnotists on, uh, uh, on TV, on stage, 
doing their doing their thing and yep. making people become chickens and things like that. That's a hypnotist. <laughs> That's a hypnotist, not a hypnotherapist. <laughs> okay, yes. so you're yes. not going to make your clients look like chickens. No, no, it wouldn't be helpful. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> not this time, but I mean, I can explain to you how that happens. Yeah. So the whole idea about hypnotherapy is that it, it's designed. You have techniques to shut down the senses. Yeah. Shut, shut down the vision. Shut down the um, the feeling, the touch and uh, auditory so it's, it's basically tricking the mind into shutting the senses down so you're not you're not uh, absorbing um, or you're not sensorily aware you go into this theta state okay. the brainwave of theta state a trance wow that sounds mm. complicated well uh, not when you know what you're doing you know what you're doing and <laughs> it, it kind of works but you know, just to talk about a trance you know you're watching tv and you don't know you for the last five minutes and you haven't been focusing on what's happening mm. you're driving along in your car remember that time that you didn't know where you'd been the last few kilometers <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah, scary a few times yeah. right. um, that's, so, that's a trance yeah okay mm. so mm. what are the benefits of, of hypnotherapy and how does it work particularly for someone struggling with suicidal thoughts or ideology yeah okay so it's it's another it's another form of therapy and in it there are different types so for someone suffering from a, a, a persistent habitual thought, mm -hmm. hab, uh, obsessive thinking, someone who's um, anxious or depressed because of, of a persistent or emotion that's become a kind of habit, mm. um, you access change through, through um, taking them under and getting their brain at the theta state. Mm -hmm. As children from zero to seven and older, our brain is mostly in theta state anyway. That's why kids are always imagining things and okay. that's why they're imagining the world. Oh. And that's where we, um, and that's why that we create, create the, the person from the age of, you heard Rudyard Kipling say, give me the ma boy at seven, I'll give you the man. Okay. That's scientifically true. Yeah. Because there's a creation of, of attitudes and beliefs about yourself when your brain's in a theta state as a okay. kid. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Um, you were going to show, show, share us your drawing here. Yeah, so th this is an example of what, how the processes work. So we've got our, we've got our six, our six senses coming in, you know, vision, hearing, taste, uh, uh, smell. This is how we process life. Yeah, mm -hmm. life comes in at yep. us. Okay, it goes through a filter in our unconscious, and this filter processes the information that's coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay, it deletes, distorts, suppresses, generalizes. It basically filters out what's useful and discards what's not. Mm. Okay. Nonetheless, if it's still d discarded, it's still there somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this filter becomes very important and this filter changes with time and beliefs are another thing that changes our filter. Beliefs we made up about ourselves as a kid. Mm -hmm. So that's how we see life, translate life. Anyway, so this goes through the filter. We create, we create internal representations in our unconscious. Our unconscious works in symbols. Or feelings, you know. Mm -hmm. story, that's why storytelling is so powerful. That's why imagery is so powerful. It, it actually works at an unconscious level. And so we have internal representations of of what things are, and the processes and techniques in hypnotherapy and NLP access change here at the internal representation. So it's designed. We could go to a regression. We go back in a memory, and we could shift the perception of the memory. Mm. Why? Because in the unconscious mind, time is not linear. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know this, anything that happened to us as kids, we can feel as, as intense and emotional about it now as we did back then. Mm -hmm. That's why there's no linear time in the unconscious. Yep. And we're one of the, f the few sentient being, well, the sentient being that, that um, this comes back again and again. Now I'm going on a bit. No, so, um, so this creates emotional states and our physiology, which creates behavior, okay? So that's, that's how you, the process you use to bring someone through hypnotherapy? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. 
This is processes here. Now there are different processes. There's embedding, there's regression, there's changing state, different kinds of way to do it. Okay. Mm. And you found that successful moving people through su suicidal thoughts or? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Mm. It doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, why, do, why doesn't it work for anyone? I mean, yeah. it can work for everyone, but is there a reason why it doesn't work? Yeah, generally it's because one, um, there's a lack of trust, mm -hmm. which, which could be completely understandable mm -hmm. depending on the trauma. Yep. Um, too analytical, people that are too much in their head and, and, mm -hmm. and can't let them, their mind go. There's kind of a, you want to grab onto their consciousness because uh, if they don't, then they lose control. Yep. So there, there's a fear-based thing. And so that's some people are like that. And so in that case, I'd probably spend a lot of time building their resilience or building, building up their ability to, well, to deal with their emotions. So there's other techniques that you can do for someone that's too analytical or not trusting sure. so that you can work on a different program, process. Yeah, okay, yeah. That's and good. I, and I, I guess that's the difference in my work. I can bring in different modalities. I'm not, I'm not stuck on one, any one, one thing. Mm. Everyone's different. And so that's part of, part of calibrating a client. Okay. Yeah. David, one of the things that got me involved in the Beacon Fight for Life or going down this path was that I had a friend come to me the day before he took his own life and I didn't pick up the signs. Mm. Now, what you've been talking about is working with the client that's in that situation. Mm. But before that, if we go back, it's up to really that person to take themselves along or someone that knows them to identify that they might need help. Mm. So how do I... How can I help my depressed or loved, loved one effectively mm. without imposing or taking that on personally? Mm. So if I've identified that mm. I've got a friend and you know, being aware of their change of mood or, or how, they're, how they're acting, um, and then I think maybe I should have a talk with them, mm. but you know, I wanna do that effectively or someone out there wants to do it effectively, how, what's the best approach for that? Yeah, well, um, it, it's sometimes difficult, especially if your family, I'm sure you know what it's like, you know, mm. we have the ability as a family to, to push each other's buttons mm. and what can be seen as, from one, one person seen as an attempt at loving, can, can be seen, interpreted by the, mm. the other person as, yeah. as controlling. Yep. So and this is the thing that we're up against the whole time. And... Um, so by broaching that subject, I guess <clears throat> you have to have an attitude of compassion first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, in Australian culture, I'm sure people that have come here have come to see this. It's getting better, mm. but there's a kind of a, a suck it up syndrome, yep. a suck it up mentality, which, which uh, is dangerous. Mm. It doesn't account for the fact that we're all emotional beings, every single one of us. Yeah. De you know, it doesn't depend on your gender. We're, you know, we, we need to embrace the fact that we are emotional, we are sensitive beings. And, mm. and uh, if you kind of ride over the top of stuff, you, you're going to miss out on, on f you know, finding out that people are genuinely hurting. And, and if you have this attitude where you, you don't feel like you can express, then, then it's dangerous, mm -hmm. you know. Um, did I answer your question? I think you're on the path to answering mm. it. So mm. it's really, that's the thought process you need to take on if you're going to approach the situation. So mm. you found someone, you know someone that you, closely and they, they're, they're not themselves, they're acting strangely or doing things or withdrawn or mm. all of those signs that you could be looking for. Mm. You know, you, you want to help them through the process. So you want to be non-judgmental mm. when you're listening. You want to listen mm. non-judgmentally and mm. then you want to help them get to you or mm. get to a psychologist. Mm. So uh, it just really was about how do they not take that on personally because mm. that person's got, got themselves in a situation that's maybe not any relation or not related to you. You just want to make sure that you can help them without taking it on personally because it could be overwhelming for the person wanting to take on the challenge. Absolutely. And especially when you're used to getting the response of, you know, the cry wolf thing, you know, for years you've been getting this, are you okay, you okay, you okay? Mm. And uh, for the person that's suffering, it might just be another you okay, mm. meaning nothing. So if there's genuine, you've noticed genuine observation of, of dysfunctionality, if you're, if, if you're not, you know, for example, 
you're not, your hygiene's no great or, you, or you're not doing your usual routine or you're not doing the things or you're isolating or you're avoiding mm. or, uh, or those signs of depression mm. or anxiety. Um, I would start, if, if your relationship isn't great, I would start by calibrating where you can access their listening. And I suggest by accessing their listening is by you being vulnerable first. Okay, can we have an example of that? Yeah, sure, you know, it'd be like, well, when I was, you know, when I was a kid or when I was um, a teenager, you know, dad did this or mum did this and, yeah. and uh, I, you know, I didn't leave my room for three weeks. And, uh, and I was really lost and I didn't know where I, was, where, I was, where I was going to go. So that's showing your vulnerability. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And hopefully accessing a kind of space to open up for. So whatever you have to do to create space for that... For them to open up. To ...person to walk into. Whatever. And if you know them well enough, that's potentially what will take place. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and another thing too, it's just really important. There's always shame and guilt around depression, no matter what it is. It's just seemed to pass and parcel. Pass and parcel, and um, is to just tell them that there's nothing wrong and there will be no judgment, mm. regardless. And everyone has a secret, everyone has an issue, everyone has something that they are ashamed of. Mm. Every single person on this planet, and so then no one's any different, and that, and that needs to be impressed upon them. Okay, mm. you've done work of addiction and mm. mental, mental health or mental issues. Mm. Can you t t uh, tell, tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I worked in, in Bali at Savannah Treatment Centre for five years and uh, as a counsellor there. And um, had people from all over the world join us for, for addiction and uh, plus a variety of co-occurring illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and that was fascinating for me. Mm -hmm. because we had people at the end of their tether, rock bottom, nowhere else to go, desperate. On one hand, challenging as hell, but on the other hand, um, what, a, what a great environment for a therapist because you have a captive audience. These people are kind of, please help me. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, what can you do for me? Now, they've taken the first step, the courage mm. to change. Yep. You know, I, for all you addicts out there, you guys that are suffering, to make the decision to change, to do something about it, that's the hardest thing you'll ever have to do mm -hmm. and the most courageous thing you'll ever have to do. First the, admitting the, it. Admitting it and getting help. Bang, you, you're halfway there, yeah. On that subject, is people that have an addiction, is everyone that overindulges mm. an addict? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's such thing as a heavy drinker, for example. Yep. Okay. He's the guy that could uh, drink all weekend mm -hmm. and then not drink all week, even though that could be an addict too. But he's also the guy that can say, I'm going to stop now and stops. Mm -hmm. An addict can't say stop mm -hmm. or, or can't stop. I don't, heard, heard, I don't know if you've heard of the adage, uh, one's not enough and a thousand is too many. No, sorry. One's, one's too many, a thousand not enough. That's it. The other okay. way around. Yeah. Okay. It's a dissatisfaction. It's never satisfied. That's and just never satisfied. That's, that's the addict's lot. Ah. Mm. So with an addiction, I've read there's usually not just one mental issue. There could be multiple. Yeah. And, and the addiction is to be a screen for the, for the mental issue. Is that, is that, have I got that right? Yeah, in most good treatment centres, there will be an, a thorough assessment process mm -hmm. and where there will be a, a series of questions about generalised anxiety disorder, about any phobias, about, um, you know, OCD, uh, sexual issues, gambling issues, all kinds of things. So there will be an assessment process. Um, and usually, most of the time, actually, in my case, I did a little survey of my clients. 100% mm -hmm. of the time, there was, an, there was a co-occurring issue or mental illness. Okay. And um, I'll, sh shall I give you those stats here? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. So yes, there is a correlation between mental issues and, um, and, and addictions, and um, most treatment centers do aim to treat both. 
So I, my, in my random sample of my clients, 30 clients, 75% male, 25% female, mm -hmm. uh, average age 34.5. So that's, that's, you know, that's pretty telling because they, they know they've, generally they've know they've had a problem mm -hmm. since their mid twenties mm -hmm. and they try and try and see if they can grow out of it and find they can't. Yeah. So that, that's, that's why that age is prevalent. Co-occurring problems, 100%. Uh, PTSD, traumatic, post-traumatic stress. You know, I've got the 40% uh, of my, that 30 in one way or another, I believe, had some kind of trauma. And this is a really important factor, no matter where you're from or what happened to you. Someone else's stubbed toe is another person's, uh, you know, violent abuse. Trauma is, di is different to everybody. It's how, how they can deal with it. Yep. Uh, anxiety, 50%. Self-esteem, 45%. Depression, 25%. OCD, obsessive compulsive. I mean, that goes hand in hand. You know, there's an obsession about something that's 50%. And then profound issues, self-harming, psychosis, schizophrenia, all, all those kind of things. Uh, bipolar, eating disorders, 20%. Mm -hmm. And um, so for most of those people, a lot of them are still dealing with the secondary issue. So they got clean, they're maintaining their addiction recovery, but they'll always have to keep working at, at, the, other, at the other issues. Okay, yeah. so is, is there a link between addiction and suicide? Uh, of course there is, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> join the dots you know someone it's not all the time but generally someone will be self-medicating for a reason mm -hmm. so someone will be using substances or uh, of any of any kind to make them feel better mm -hmm. it's quite often said in, in in addiction addicts feel a hole in their in their body there's a hole missing you know this something missing something missing there's yeah. an emptiness yeah and that always needs filling and alcohol and substances did that, or, or sex, or shopping, or gambling, or, or whatever, fills that hole, mm -hmm. which is basically and chemically transferred to a dopamine issue in the brain. Um, but um, so, if you're battling with life, if you're depressed, if there's financial issues, there will be a uh, tendency to kind of find a solution. And generally, solutions are substances, behaviours, treatment, or, or death. They're the, they're the choices. Yeah. To to get away with the feeling of feeling, and and quite often with addiction, if 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 you've got this, and the core emotion of addiction is shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. If you've got this shame and guilt that's stewing there, it's always going to it's always going to be a problem. And especially if you're in the heart of drugs. Your ease of killing yourself is going to be more accessible. It, it's, it's going to be kind of, and, so, and uh, chances of it being accidental are higher too. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's a bit heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a bit heavy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's neat. It, it needs to be known. It needs, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is identifying it and then is doing something about it. And that's yeah. what we're here about to make yeah. sure we, we're going to do that. But we also want to touch on challenging my self-sabotaging belief system. Sure. Sure. So, yes, um, we've all got it, haven't we? Uh, I don't know, have we? I don't know. Of course, I think. Have we? Well, I do. <laughs> so, so, once again, I'm going to go back to the childhood stuff zero to yeah. seven, zero to eight. Yeah. Brain is in theta state. Okay, everything is said to us, it's done to us, we believe is truth. Bang, it's in there. I'm not good enough. I'm alone. I'm, I, I'm, not I'm misunderstood. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll tell you my little story. Do you want yeah. a little story? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. So I was four years old. My dad bought me a, a, a little boat. We took it up to the lake. And we put, I put it in the lake and I was following this little boat along the lake and it went out to the middle of the lake and it sunk, it disappeared. And there and then, I made up in my mind, everything I love, I lose. Mm. Yeah. Okay, you might believe it or not, but it makes sense to me that this belief was cemented unconsciously. Mm. Everything I love, I lose. 
So for, for a lot of my life, I've, I'd fall in love with a girl and I'd sabotage it because I'm going to lose her. Yeah. I'd fall in love with a job and I'd sabotage it because I'm going to lose it. It's kind of the expectation that I was going to lose it. Yeah. So the, the thing about these limiting beliefs about ourselves that we look for evidence to support it. Ah. It's, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. What you look for is what you get. Yeah. You just start to manifest. Yeah. And it, healing that's all about diminishing its power yep. because it, it isn't the truth. It was something happened when you were in theta state that you were programmed to think that way. That's your filter. And you watch everywhere in your life where you suffer on an emotional level will be a trigger of a limiting belief. Mm. It's a good awareness to and have. And that takes us back to hypnotherapy. Yes, it and does. That's the process yeah. about going back, regressing, identifying, finding that anchor. Change the it, belief change the belief wow also you touch on loving and att or attaching mm. yeah okay so when, when we asked me to do this I, I kind of thought of I was trying to put myself in those in the mind of someone who who couldn't see you know sense of doom who couldn't see cl clearly couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel mm. And what are the things about this? One of them is relationships, you know, and love, love and attaching. What's love? What's attaching? I'm not to going to pretend to define love, but I know what it's not. I also know what attachment is, mm -hmm. and we're going to be talking about, you know, codependency. You know, my feelings depend on my partner's mood. Mm, it's dangerous. Yeah, my values depend on my partner. Mm. You know, it's about it's about identifying. Your, your needs and, and honoring your needs. But if, you're, if your um, experiences of relationships, if you've witnessed you know, your, your parents, for example, dysfunctionally disrespecting each other, you're not gonna have an idea of, of what it is to have a healthy relationship. I'm not gonna talk about love, but a healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. And a couple of things about that, you know, they used to say, um, you know, you complete me. For example, that's, that's kind of a romantic idea of love. You, my partner completes me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's kind of very disempowering. And I'd like to reframe that to kind of, you know, we share our completeness. So it's a bit of an individuality thing. Yeah. And getting away from the codependence, the self-esteem, not looking for others to compensate for what's missing. And I think we spend a lot of time doing that. Mm. Mm. So you help people identify themselves and go back to the basics, I guess, with, you know, with un unraveling all of that, even going back to their childhood yeah. and helping them reprogram. Yeah. It's foundational. Yeah. It has to be. Yeah. I always like to finish on a, on a positive note because I think we've, we've talked about a lot of dark areas mm. and again mm. for, for a reason because mm. if you can um, connect on any level or understand that you know maybe you know someone or these are feelings that you're feeling you know going to see David or going to see a hypnotherapist would be a, a good starting point you know mm. if you've gone past the GP you've spoken to your GP you know before I get there you know do you what do you what are your thoughts on medication yeah well uh, mm, okay so my personal thoughts on medication, on antidepressants mm. and, and those kind of things. Um, a lot of it is overkill for something. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the people that, that take them probably half don't need to. Mm -hmm. there's, because it's about a chemical imbalance. Mm -hmm. And I know moods and emotions do change the chemi chemical chemistry in the brain. Yeah. But my experience, and I've had this with some of my clients, is that um, they've wanted to go on them because they're just, they're just sick of feeling the way they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And we've tried different therapeutic techniques. And on occasion, well, on occasion they work. So I, I would always make sure it's the last resort. Mm -hmm. And the thing, thing about getting help is that... Um, if you're feeling that way. I'd just like to say something about, about the suicide um, attitude. Like it, it's fascinating to me that people flirt with it as a solution. 
And a really powerful way to frame it, because you know, people with suicide say, I, I just don't want to live anymore. I don't want to live anymore. So here's how I would reframe it. I just don't know how to do the process of living. And that needs to be the question for any of you guys out there feeling that bad. Ask yourself that question. I don't know how to do the process of living. I need to ask someone how. Wow. Yeah. Yeah? Start searching for an answer of yeah. how, to, how to feel better or how to think differently. Both. How to feel better and how to think differently. Yeah. So going back then, finishing on, a, on an uplifting note, have you got any... You, I'm sure you've got plenty of them, but can you share, you know, someone's journey and how you've seen them, where they started and where they ended, you know, up the sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, look, I've had clients, especially, come to the treatment centre that could hardly speak and they're, and they're on these heavy drugs, heavy anti antipsychotics, and, and we've discovered that uh, they were half the problem. And so we've dealt with that and then we've worked on... Um, Oh, so many stories of that. Worked on their self-awareness. And people, when they're desperate enough or inspired enough, take it on board. Mm. And, you know, I've, I've still in, I've had people ring me up out of the blue just thanking me and, and they, leave, they leave treatment centres, you know, not being able to speak and walking funny, coming out just full of energy and full of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've seen people that you would think are hopeless succeed beyond their wildest dreams. And look, even if you don't think there is any hope, um, there always is. There's always an ability to get to a place where you can see hope. If, if you can get to a place where you can actually see it from a distance, then that's a start. Yeah. So identifying first that you've got a, an addiction or identifying first that you need to seek another solution how did you reframe that again? Uh, the the, the uh, about doing the process of living. Yeah, yeah. So reframe your thinking. If you're sick of living, if you you're sick of trying to do what people expect you to do, that needs to shift. Mm -hmm. Someone needs to see you for you, because you might do things differently, mm -hmm. and access and find access your power through your resources, your means, but to reframe it in a way where you just need to know how to do the process of living. How do I live in this world that I'm not liking? How do I live in it? There are always ways, there are different ways. Maybe ways you didn't even think were possible. Yeah. David, how can someone get hold of you if they'd like to reach out to you when they, they're watching this video or you know, they, they think they could benefit from seeing you? How could they get in touch with you? Uh, well, I've got my website. Uh, they can get in touch with you, Derek. Mm -hmm. You've got my details, but yeah. my website's uh, www.changewithdavidelsey.com, E-L-S-E-Y. And uh, I've got my contact details on that and also what I do. Again, thank you so much for being part of my, uh, the Beacon Fight for Life, David. I really appreciate it. Okay, guys, that's it from me and uh, Derek Best, Beacon Fight for Life, and make sure you take the time to smile today. Thank you. Thank you.